Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'da habita fillah Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Hayyakum Allah Continue on in our study of Bulugh Maram <coughs> uh, The Book of Marriage We reach uh, chapter 8 Al Raja'a And this is the uh, taking back of a wife after after divorce, uh, a divorce that is uh, not a final divorce, which is called talaq al ba'in. Uh, in this chapter, <coughs> this chapter consists of some ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, referring to the process of raja'a, of the process of returning one's wife. Uh, of one's wife returning to the man who has divorced his wife and it is a, when it is not an irrevocable uh, uh, divorce. And so the group of ahadith that are contained therein in this chapter uh, are discussing those issues and giving evidence for the issue of taking one's wife uh, back. Uh, taking one's wife back this refers to taking back one's revocably divorced wife during her waiting period. So this is during her idda. Uh, without a new marriage contract, uh, and this is a, a permissible according to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, and the consensus of the ulama, the consensus or the ijma of the scholars, meaning that when a man divorces his wife, that she has her waiting period to determine whether she is pregnant or not, and also which gives a chance for the husband and wife to reconcile if uh, they uh, wish to do so. And so this is called a raja. Concerning the proof of the legality of uh, raja uh, is uh, from the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kitab al Karim. And this is in uh, uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 228. And their husbands have more right to take them back in this period if they want reconciliation. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is letting us know the mashru'iyah uh, of raja'ah, that this is a means for the husband and wife to reconcile. Uh, and that this gives the the former the former husband the choice uh, first and foremost to be with his wife who he divorced if it is once or twice and uh, this allows for that rec reconciliation and that uh, no one else is able to uh, propose to her and marry her during this time period until she finishes her idda which means her waiting period. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says also in Fi Kitab al Kareem, Surah Al Baqarah, verse 229, divorce is twice. Uh, then after that, either keep her in an acceptable manner or release her with good treatment. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here mentions that the, the talaq, this, this means the divorce, the reconcilable uh, divorce, meaning that you divorce and you're able to. Uh, reconciliate after this divorce, that's only twice. The third one, no. This is called talaq al-ba'in. This is the irrevocable uh, divorce. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, then after that, either keep her in acceptable uh, manner, in an acceptable manner, or release her with good treatment. Showing us that Islam that those people who say they claim to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu that they are constrained by that which is good, which is treating your wife with good and kind, with goodness and kindness, and respect, and either taking her back in a good manner, you know, not with ill will and and and, and harshness and, and and bad treatment, or freeing her uh, in with good treatment, setting her free, meaning that you are khalas, you're, you're divorced, you're finished, and everyone goes their separate ways in an amicable manner, in a kind manner. And this is what Islam calls us to. 
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kitab al -Kareem, and when they have nearly finished their term, either retain them according to acceptable terms or part with them according to acceptable terms. So letting us know that kind treatment, this is the asl uh, of, of Islam. As for the sunnah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said uh, about Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala when he divorced his wife, his wife, order him to take her back. And we talked about this hadith prior to this, uh, uh, the differences of opinion with regarding the scholars, with regarding to this hadith. However, in general, this is one of the evidences for uh, after uh, divorce that during the waiting period uh, to, to, to take your wife back. And you're only ordered to take something back after you have uh, you know, for example, taking your wife back after you have been with her. And that means during a period when it's still permissible for you to do so. Ibn Mundar said regarding this, he said, scholars unanimously agree that taking back one's wife during her waiting period is permissible for the freeman who has made less than three pronouncements of divorce and for the slave man who has made less than two pronouncements of divorce. And uh, the wisdom behind the legality of taking one's wife, uh, divorced wife back, is that it's a chance for the husband, if he regrets divorcing his wife, uh, and he wants to maintain the marital life with her again, uh, that this is a kind of divine mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon his servants in, in order to, him res to, to restore their family again. Some of the uh, conditions for the validity of taking one's uh, wife back, number one, the number of pronouncements of divorce made by the husband must be less than three, uh, as, as we mentioned. Uh, the second condition is that the divorce must be after the consummation of marriage. Okay, so this divorce, this uh, enda, this is after the consummation or uh, uh, not just the end of, but even the ability to make raja to take her back. If the husband divorces his wife before having sexual intercourse with her, he cannot take her back, for she has no waiting period in this case. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in this regard, oh, you have believed when you married believing women and uh, then divorced them before you have touched them, uh, then there is not, not for you any waiting period to count concerning them. So provide for them and give them a gracious release, meaning set, you know, separate with them in kindness and uh, with a gift if, if one is able to do so. Uh, the third condition is that the divorce must not be in return for a compensation. So it shouldn't be like what we already studied, which was the khula. It shouldn't be that the woman is asking uh, for the husband to divorce her and she's giving a, a gift willing to return her mahar. Because uh, then in that case, uh, if she is given this compensation, compensation to her husband to separate from him, uh, then there is no taking her back in this case because it contradicts the whole purpose of her paying, uh, returning the mahar or some uh, amicable gift. Uh, the fourth condition is marriage must be originally valid, that it should be a valid marriage. The nikah that originally took place should be a lawful nikah with the conditions for nikah in place. Uh, and the fifth condition is that the husband must take his wife during her waiting period. So it should be the raja'ah should take place during the iddah, of course. You cannot make raja'ah outside of the iddah. For example, uh, if the woman has completed her three... Uh, either the three months or the three, uh, her three menstrual cycles, then in that case, there is no uh, raja at that point. At that point, if it was the first divorce between them, then it would require, if they wanted to reconcile or get back together, it would require for them to, t to make a new marriage contract. So, as, it, as if it were anyone else who was marrying her. So that's very important for us to understand uh, that it has to be during the idda uh, in order to return the uh, the wife back to the husband. Uh, another 
condition is the husband's taking back of his wife must not be uh, a conditional thing. For example, it is not uh, uh, valid for a husband to say to his wife, if such and such happens, I will take you back. So it shouldn't be a conditional thing. This is a thing, this is a thing to bring your family back. And so this is a part of the validity. As scholars differ, uh, although scholars differ with regards to this, but this does not show a, uh, you know, by making a condition is a is something which is, is not a just and amicable way with dealing with uh, someone who was your partner, who was your family. And so those are just some of the, those are the conditions with regarding the, uh, the Raja'a. Uh, moving on to the first hadith, the 928th hadith narrated Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'an. He was asked about a man who divorces uh, his wife then takes her back without taking witnesses on either. So he replied, get witnesses on her divorce and on her return. Uh, Abu Dawood reported as Mokuf a saying of a companion and its chain of narrators is uh, sahih or sound. Authentic. Al Bayhaqi reported the aforesaid hadith with this wording. Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu was asked about someone who takes his wife back after divorce that is not final, but he does not take witnesses. So he replied, It is not Sunnah, uh, and he should get witness get witnesses now. A Tabarani added in the narration, and he should ask Allah's forgiveness. So in this hadith, this hadith and, and the scholars they differ over the uh, the taking back of the witnesses, but uh, taking back with witnesses and the divorcing with witnesses as far as the validity. But what it seems uh, from the evidence and from what, uh, according to uh, some of the ulama, is that uh, during divorce that it is. Um, uh, recommended, you know, that it is mishroor, or we should say that it is mishroor, it is legislated. So it is permissible, of course, to have a couple of witnesses to witness when you are divorcing your wife. Uh, and uh, so this is one of the things we gained from this hadith. So from this hadith, we gain one of the benefits is that it shows that it is mishroor, it is a legislated thing that uh, during uh, divorce, and likewise, on taking one's wife back, that it is mishroor. It is legislated. It is something legislated. It's permissible to do. Uh, another benefit we gain from this hadith, according to the statement of Imran ibn Hussein, ta'an, is that these witnesses to take one's wife back uh, is wajib. And this is according to the statement, and as we mentioned, the scholars differ over this. However, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, uh, that it is not an obligation, okay? But as we said, some of the scholars hold that it is an obligation to bring witnesses for the return. However, if you are in your home and simply as simple as wanting to have relations with your wife and you have wife, you have a wife and she's in her edda and you still have time that just even having sexual relations between you, that this is the taking back. You, of course, you're not just having sexual relations and then you go back to your same uh, condition. This is a not a a strong view and goes against the maqasid or the intention of marriage and the mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put between uh, the cu couples. And another point with regards to this hadith where some hold the, the view that it is an obligation to have or that is wajib to have a uh, have witnesses during the Raja'a to take one's wife back is from the statement of Imran uh, Imran bin Hussein radiallahu ta'ala when he said was sung for Allah and seek forgiveness from Allah in that this is to make his istighfar uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make up for the shortcomings of, of departing from the sunnah or maybe departing from that which is wajib so this is the understanding some of the scholars mentioned with regards to this hadith. Another last point with this hadith is this hadith 
uh, illustrates for us uh, the seriousness and the importance of the uh, Raja'a and as we studied pr prior to this and some of the other ahadith that this is one of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, that is a very serious thing that is uh, playing with is is not uh, is impermissible and it is a very serious matter so if one plays in these affairs that this is sinful and not becoming of a mu'min those are some of the benefits uh, of this hadith in the next hadith, the last hadith of this bab, narrated Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he divorced his wife, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Umar uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, command him to take her back. And this is mutafakun alayhi. This is agreed upon. From this hadith, uh, we learn one of the benefits here in, of this hadith is the permissibility for aside from the hukum of uh, taking one's wife back, a raja'a, but also the permissibility of having someone else, of having a wakil, meaning someone to do something on your behalf uh, when uh, giving knowledge or even when uh, during the mar marital process, sometimes people marry from long distance. And so it is permissible for one to appoint a wakil who on their behalf will be, uh, you know, they've given them permission to accept and participate uh, and sign the marital act or be present with the imam because they are far away. Perhaps they're in prison, perhaps they're in another country, whatever the case may be, they can make a wakala on their behalf. Those are some of the main benefits of the ahadith in this chapter. In the next chapter, chapter 9, Bab al Ilai wa Dhihari wa Kafari. This is the chapter of al Ilai and will explain shortly the meanings and al Dhihar, which is also a type of uh, falling under the chapter of divorce and a kafara, and a kafara, similar to the other types of kafara, has to do with expiation. What is the expiation for the one who uh, <clears throat> falls into one of these pronouncements? And al-ila, this word refers to uh, making a vow, so that's why we're talking about kafara and expiating, uh, is because al-ila is actually it means to make a vow that one is not going to maintain sexual relations with his wife or to say to her directly, swearing by Allah, that no sexual relationship will be maintained with her in the future. Uh, Allah has prescribed a four months period to restore the relationship. It is better to revive the relationship by paying expiation for the oath within the prescribed period. Otherwise, Divorce will become effective by itself, or according to others, the man will be compelled to divorce her or bring back the relationship to normal again. So this is what ila means. Uh, ila, al ila, and this uh, is a type of vow, as as we mentioned, and the uh, har. Dhihar refers to, it's derived from the word dhahar. A dhahar in Arabic refers to one's back. And dhihar meaning back, uh, so it's making a resemblance between one's, one's wife and uh, the, the, the back of one's mother. Okay, This is a figure of speech in the Arabic language, which means that you are like my mother and unlawful for me for marriage. According to Sharia terminology, dhihar means comparing one's wife and to uh, to one's uh, mother and making her unlawful for oneself. It is not considered a divorce in Sharia, but one has to expiate for it before returning to his wife. Its expiation is to free a slave or to fast for 60 days consecutively 
or to feed 60 poor persons. It is compulsory to, uh, to bear one of these punishments. And the third term, which is important for us in this chapter, is kafara. And al kafara, this refers to the expiation, is the expiation we just mentioned, which is to either free a slave or fast two months, uh, 60 days consecutively uh, without taking a break, or uh, to feed 60 uh, poor persons. So that is what it uh, refers to, kafara. Uh, in the 930th hadith, narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, swore that he would stay away from his wives for a period. He made something unlawful for himself, something uh, so he made the lawful unlawful and he made atonement for breaking an oath reported by a Tirmidhi and its narrators are reliable or thika. This hadith shows us that <clears throat> the hukum of uh, al ila al ila and that this uh, this uh, hadith uh, illustrates for us that the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam did practice this with his wives. And as is mentioned in the hadith, uh, the Prophet Salam, he swore that he would stay away from his wives for a certain period. So from this hadith, we learn that it is permissible to uh, for this practice. It shows us that it is permissible to practice this uh, this practice and that uh, however there it is conditional in that a person does not go beyond four months that four months is the limit and also another condition is that a person cannot do this without some reason that they're that this actually is something that's mishroor, it's legislated, it's permissible because we see the Prophet did it. And that it should be done for a reason, not just uh, as something whimsical. Uh, because this has to do with the rights uh, of someone else. And this is the right of the woman to have relations with her husband. And likewise, the husband has the right of course, to have relations with his wife. And the seriousness uh, of this matter. So this, as some of the scholars, they mention that this is from the Bab at tazir meaning that this is uh, as a type of punishment which is not uh, specifically defined in the sh- Sharia. So that the imam uh, legislates or or decides a punishment for some particular act. For example, in some countries, like in Saudi Arabia, you have the death penalty for drugs because drugs uh, weren't necessarily a problem during the time of the Prophet Wasallam. They had khamar, they had other things. So it is a type of ta'zir from the imam that this is something harmful, it's something uh, impermissible, which I think no one has any doubt about, but there's no prescribed punishment in the Sharia. So the Imam, has, uh, which means the leader in Saudi Arabia, has determined that in that society that uh, the appropriate punishment is death. Likewise in Indonesia and I believe in some other uh, Muslim countries, they have similar uh, punishments. And this is from the Bab of uh, Ta'ziyah. So likewise, this is a type of ta'zir, a type of punishment. You know, if there is a type of maslaha, maybe a person has a very disobedient wife or whatever the case may be, and that he is, uh, he decides and he makes al ila for the, uh, as a type of uh, punishment, if you will, uh, in order to, uh, 
uh, hopefully rectify their marital uh, situation. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that to prohibit something with the intention of, of uh, ceasing from it or stopping it, that the expiation for that is that it's uh, uh, yaminin, meaning that there is, a, you know, a person must make kafara, make must make uh, because it's a it's a type of vow so for example the situation uh, at hand although as is mentioned in the hadith uh, he made something unlawful for himself uh, he made something unlawful for himself so although that this is uh, the the from a linguistic point of view, uh, that this is described as making something lawful, unlawful, in, in that he swore that he would not come near them or have relations with them, and they are normally, they are lawful for him because they're his wives. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, radiallahu So they are his wives, and normally it's lawful to have relations, but he swore to not have relations with them. So he took this vow. This is not actually making istihlal. This is not making something the something which is normally uh, lawful for a person unlawful because there's no issue of ittiqad. There's no uh, creed in that that they are no longer, they are prohibited from me. Prohibited for me for a period of time. This is not the case. So that's a difference between making something lawful that is unlawful or something unlawful lawful that's a very important thing that we need to uh, distinguish there so this hadith shows us that this tahrim uh, is not making istihlal it's not making istihlal but rather this is tahrim in the sense that a person is uh, refraining themselves from a particular action and in this case when in, in the marital bond, if a man says to his wife, by Allah, I'm not going to have relations with you for four months or something like this. And it can only be up to four months, as we mentioned. So that is uh, the case in that uh, hadith. Those are some of the benefits of that hadith. In the next hadith, uh, narrated Ibn Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, When a period of four months elapses, the one who swears to stay away from his wife must be made to return to her or divorce her. And the divorce is not valid till the husband himself pronounces it. Uh, and, and this is in Bukhari. Uh, in this hadith, uh, this is in the case of uh, al ila the man should be asked either to divorce or restore the relationship after the passing of four months. If he is not willing in either case, then she can get her marriage canceled with the permission of the ruler. And after passing her end of period, she is allowed to marry. So this is very important. This gives us the, this hadith makes clear for us al bayan or clarification on how to practice this institution uh, of al-ila, al al-ila, uh, in Islam and that if this situation uh, arises a case uh, similar to this arises that of course uh, if it's within the four month period and the husband decides to uh, break that you know he must make the expiation uh, the kafara which is encouraged to do in the case in which he uh, does not uh, you know, he does not rectify that situation and pay the kafara and the four months period has elapsed and then he is not willing to make some decision either to divorce her or to uh, 
uh, you know, to divorce her or take her back, you know, you know, to 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 remain to come back in his marital bond as it was by having relations with his family, his wife, then uh, then the ruler it can be brought to the ruler or the judge, and he can dissolve the marriage because this is would be infringing upon her rights. <clears throat> From this hadith, some of the uh, benefits of this hadith uh, is this hadith is evidence that uh, uh, the husband cannot be forced to divorce his wife before the four month period has elapsed. Meaning that if it's three months and the wife, she's she's tired of this situation, obviously, and, and the husband is adamant on keeping this this uh, going to four months or, you know, it's still within the four month period, the judge cannot, uh, this hadith is evidence that the judge cannot uh, separate them in and divorce them. So that's one of the main uh, benefits uh, of this hadith. In the next hadith, the 932nd hadith, narrated Suleiman ibn Yasar, radiallahu ta'ala he said, I met 13 or more of the companions of Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All of them made the one who swears to stay away from his wife return to her or divorce her at the end of the period, meaning the end of the four months, reported by a Shafi'i. So in this narration, the narration of uh, Yasar, uh, we also see that this hadith is uh, is evidence that the husband cannot be made to uh, within that four months period cannot be made to divorce his uh, to divorce his 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 wife. But however, uh, as is mentioned in, in the Athar, is that. Uh, Suleiman ibn Yasar radiallahu ta'ala he said I met 13 or more of the companions of the lost messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam all of them made the one who swears to stay away from his wife return to her or divorce, divorce her at the end of the period so at the end of the time period and that's why it's Dalil showing us it's evidence showing us that before the Dalil that they don't have the right to force him to divorce his wife but rather once the time period elapses of having been away from his wife, denied her for those four months, then at that period of time, then the imam can step in or the judge and force him, you know, either uh, to make a decision, either separate them or, you know, giving the husband a first and foremost the choice saying, hey, rectify your situation, return back to your wife or divorce her. If he refuses, he doesn't give any decision, then at that point of time, that's when the judge or the ruler uh, steps in and makes that uh, makes that decision for him. In the next hadith, the 933rd hadith narrated Ibn Abbas the swearing to stay away from one's wife in Al-Jahiliya era was for one or two years. Then Allah appointed a person of four, uh, a period of four months for it. So if it is less than four months, it is not swearing to stay away from one's wife. Uh, Al-Bayhaqi reported it. In this uh, narration, this hadith makes it clear that if the relations are established within the period of four months, then it is not Al-Ila. And Al-Ila. And there is no penalty for it. So that lets us know if it, the relations are reestablished within that period of four months, then that is the the hukum. Uh, likewise, this had this hadith shows that in the period of uh, of jahiliya or the days of ignorance, the woman was very unfortunate and very oppressed. So sometimes for years she stood in the middle of nowhere, meaning that she was in a situation neither married nor divorced, muallak as they say, muallak, uh, that she was hanging in between. Also, she was not allowed to remarry 
after passing her end of period. Sometimes severance of relations is necessary for the purpose of teaching her a lesson. However, separation for years at a time is unjustice to her, so Allah fixed the period as four months. So from this hadith, we see uh, several benefits that are derived from the, uh, from the scholars. And from those, from those uh, uh, benefits, from this ethar, uh, first is it shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and his religion is just. He is al-adl. And he established justice, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's because the women prior to Jahiliya were severely uh, oppressed. And men could take up to many, many wives, make this kind of relation where they didn't even have relations with them. So she's married. She can't, uh, she can't remarry. She's in a state of neither being divorced and neither being married. You know, neither having the joy of marriage, but rather almost closer to uh, being considered like a piece of property. Well, So this hadith, this athar shows the justice of Islam and that Islam did away with that uh, that type of oppression by a fix, fixing the time period if it is necessary. That doesn't mean we go around and just implementing this on our whims, but however, as we mentioned prior to this, that there's conditions that a person, uh, there, there should be some necessity for this. There should be some maslaha in this. And now, however, as we know, in many cases, the women are not going to be accepting of such uh, a practice. And in many societies, it will be difficult for us to implement. However, it is mashroor. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us uh, the the condition or the the condition of women and the status of women during the times of Jahiliya uh, in the in the in the Arab Peninsula. This is amongst the Arabs. This was not necessarily the case in uh, the con on the continent of Africa or in Asia or in the Americas or in Europe. But they all had their own forms of uh, their own customs and so forth. But this, this hadith shows us and gives us insight into the jahiliya, the ignorance, the days of ignorance, meaning prior to Islam, how these customs were practiced in the Arab uh, Peninsula, how they practiced these customs and how they treated the women. And that Islam freed them from that. Uh, another benefit of this hadith Is that uh, this hadith shows us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, restricted the time period for men during this practice to four months. He limited that time practice, whereas prior to that, they would go for one, two, or more years. So Islam uh, came and restricted that practice but did not do away with it in its entirety. entirety. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us the that in the sharia that mustalahat or terms, terminologies, as you'll see as you get further in your studies, that terminologies in the sharia, they there are many terminologies that differ that might have the same alfad or the same term, but the meaning is different in the shara. Meaning that there may be a sharia definition and there may be a linguistic definition. And this is one of those uh, cases uh, in that this uh, practice of al-ila, uh, al al that this practice is uh, in the time of Jahiliya had really no limitations. In Islam, this practice means something different in that it is limited. Likewise, uh, ta'addid, you know, or having more than one wife and prior to, uh, you know, the, 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 most, the terminology is still present in Islam but it has a different meaning in inside of Islam compared to the way it was practiced in the days of ignorance. So you'll find 
that there are uh, many terminologies that are used in the Sharia, because we're, we're talking about the Arabic language, of course, because that was the language of the Prophet wasallam and the language that the Quran was revealed in, that you'll find term, terms uh, in the, uh, or terminologies in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam that have a certain meaning and that, that, that differs from their linguistic meaning. Like in, in the Arabic language, it may mean one thing, but in the Sharia, it has a, a different meaning. So this hadith illustrates for us that principle, that at times there's a difference between the linguistic meaning and the Sharia meaning. And those are some of the main benefits of those hadith pertinent to the practice of al ida In the next hadith, the 934th hadith, narrated Ibn Abbas and radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a man had vowed to make his wife like his mother, meaning forbidden for him. Then he had intercourse with her, so he went to the Prophet ﷺ and said, I had intercourse with her before making the atonement. He replied, Do not go near her till you do what Allah has commanded you to do. Reported by Al Arba, Tirmidhi graded it as Sahih. Uh, but a Nisai held that the stronger view is that it is morsel, meaning a missing link after the Tabi'i. Al Bazar reported it through another chain from Ibn Abbas, and he added, Make an atonement and do not repeat it. Uh, in this hadith of the Prophet, uh, this hadith uh, clarifies for us the hukum. Uh, and the practice of uh, dhihar, as we mentioned. And that is to make a resemblance, to make one's wife unlawful for oneself by making a resemblance between her and uh, his mother. Uh, in this hadith, there are uh, immense fawaid, and one of the benefits of this hadith is it shows us the directness uh, and the direct way in which the Sahaba uh, were with regards to trying to arrive at the haq, at the truth. And this is taken from, uh, understood from this hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam in that the Sahabi, uh, uh, that this man had vowed to take make his wife like his mother, then he had intercourse with her, so he went to the Prophet wasallam and said, I had intercourse with her before making the atonement. The Prophet wasallam replied, do not go near her till you do what Allah has commanded you to do. So he wanted to know the hukum, although he acted and he did uh, have relations with his wife, but he... Uh, he wanted to know the hukum, so he was very direct about it. He was very direct. He said he had intercourse with her, so uh, he, he, there was no sh shyness in that regard. And this brings up the second fight, the, the second benefit, is that when it comes to the truth, and as we mentioned uh, prior to this, that there should be no shyness. That does not mean we use uh, foul language or anything which shows bad manners and illustrates bad character and bad speech, but rather sometimes it requires being direct with regards to uh, the sensitive matters and in trying to attain a hukum that the imam or the judge or the sheikh or whoever is arbitrating, they need to know and perhaps uh, it requires being more direct uh, in, in, in the speech about some topics that can be very sensitive. Uh, and this hadith illustrates this for us. Uh, another third benefit of this hadith is that this hadith shows us that the one who does dhihar uh, and then has sexual relations before they expiate, uh, then 
it is not necessary for him to make the expiation twice, but rather one time is sufficient. And we, we talked about the expiation, the kafara. Another benefit of this uh, hadith is this hadith shows us that it is impermissible, likewise, to have sexual relations before making the kafara. And that's and, and, the, and the Prophet والسلام, that's why he said very strong, he went to the Prophet والسلام, and he said, I had intercourse with her before making the atonement. The Prophet والسلام, replied, do not go near her until you do what Allah has commanded you to do. So that shows us that that is uh, that what he did was was incorrect, and the Prophet وسلم, showed him that the correct way is that you should not have relations. Uh, and so from this, uh, we we see because the Prophet ﷺ said in the imperative form, he said very strongly. This is an, this is another ruwaya, another narration. He said, "Kafir wala ta ud So the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, "Expiate and do not uh, you know repeat or you know do this again," letting us know that this was a serious matter that. Uh, he needed to expiate for before having sexual relations with his wife. In the next hadith narrated, uh, Salama ibn uh, Sakhar uh, radiallahu ta'ala he said uh, when the month of Ramadan came I feared lest I would have intercourse with my wife. So I vowed a dhihar that she was like my mother. Then one night, something of her was uncovered to me, and I had intercourse with her. Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, afterwards said to me, "Set a slave free," and I replied, "I do not possess one that I can free." He said, "Then fast two consecutive months." I replied, "Have I fallen into that which I have fallen into, except due to fasting?" He replied, "Feed sixty poor people within uh, an arak." Uh, uh, which is a basket of dates reported by Ahmed and Al-Arba except al Nisai Ibn Khuzayma and Ibn Al-Jurud uh, reported, uh, graded it as authentic uh, Ibn Al-Jarud and so from this hadith we also see many uh, uh, great benefits of, uh, from this hadith Many lessons can be learned on the practice of a dhihar. And in this hadith, we see that Salama ibn uh, Sakhar, that during the holy month of Ramadan, he was fearful of having relations with his wife. Perhaps he was a person who it was difficult to control himself, or that he was a person who was newly married. Uh, this could be the situation. This is also uh, why sometimes some of the scholars discourage from new couples, you know, people who get married right before Ramadan or right at Ramadan instead to wait after uh, because as a new couple, newly now all of a sudden in the marital bond and then it's the holy month of Ramadan, it is even more pressure and difficult to, uh, to fast and be away from one another during the day. So it's more... A person can be more prone to actually fall into the muharramat at that point, meaning that they go to their wives during uh, the, the month of Ramadan. So in the case of Salama, ta'ala, he was fearful of this. He was fearful in having relations with his wife during the whole month of Ramadan. So he made that oath, you know, made that oath, oath by stating that uh, the har upon himself in order to because he knew if he made the oath he would be very serious about fulfilling it so he made that oath or that the har in order to stay away from his wife what do we learn from this hadith one of the benefits of this hadith is this hadith shows us the very strong wara or uh, piety and humbleness of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in. And this is what we see in the case of 
of uh, Salama in that he was he he was afraid of falling into uh, what you know normally is lawful for you. This is with his wife, but because it's the holy month of Ramadan, she she is uh, prohibited from you during the day. So he was afraid of falling into that. So he made this oath. So this illustrates the wara, the humility of Salama and how the Sahaba were. Another benefit of this hadith. Is this hadith also illustrates for us that for a temporary uh, period of time, uh, is uh, is is permissible. This hadith illustrates that it is uh, a permissible uh, that it was a permissible practice, in that uh, uh, Salama made this. The har for himself for the month of uh, the holy month of Ramadan, and it also shows us that it was uh, that it you know became um, something he was responsible for for fulfilling, and that he shouldn't go uh, to his wife during that time period. Uh, another benefit of this hadith. So this uh, this shows us uh, with, with regards to this uh, practice of dihar that it isn't actually the dihar which we should say is permissible, but it means it is if a person does this, they fall into this practice, this vow, that the vow itself must be fulfilled, that they are responsible for fulfilling that vow. So it's not just a vow uh, that they. You know, for example, if someone says you're like my mother to his wife, my, like my mother's back, that now that they have done this, that they must make the expiation, the kafara, before they go to their wife. And so then that means it is now practicable. And not that this is a recommended or a... Uh, a permissible practice. So we wanted to clarify that. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is that if a person makes this vihar uh, with his wife, then he uh, returns to her and has relations with her. Then he must make the kafara. He must make the expiation. And as we learn from the hadith, the Prophet uh, ordered him to uh, you know, that that he should make this this kafara before uh, you know, returning to his wife. Uh, and another benefit from this hadith is that the hadith also illustrates that the kafara that kafara, it has uh, different levels. That first, it's freeing a slave. That second, it is uh, fasting two, consec two consecutive months. And the third level is that uh, feeding 60 uh, poor people. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith also shows us the... Uh, that the Sahaba were very clear, as we mentioned in the prior to this hadith, uh, uh, about the, you know, taining the truth, and that even if it required them saying something, which normally they might be shy about, but when it came to speaking to the Prophet والسلام, and trying to obtain a hukum, they had to be a bit more forthcoming in their language. So it shows us that this was the way of the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala, and 
And as is mentioned in the authentic hadith, in the law, la yastahi min al haq. And this is uh, the al fav or the lev or the statement of uh, um, uh, 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 Imra'a Abi Talha. This is Abi Talha's wife, in that she said this to the Prophet because she was asking about a sensitive question. She was asking at, about the orgasm of women. You know, is it. Uh, you know, you know, does a woman need to make ghusl? She said, Hal al al or the, uh, or not the, about the orgasm, but about the, um, about the wet dream of a, of, of a woman. She said, In the Allah la yastay min al haq, fa hal al al mar'a al ghusl idihi ahtalamat. You know, very Allah isn't shy of the truth. Is it upon a woman? To make ghusl if she, uh, you know, if she has experiences wetness, this wet dream. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Naam, either rat al ma. Yes, if she sees moisture. So this shows us that at times, something we're normally shy about, that at times it becomes necessary to explain more in detail or be more direct in order to obtain a hukum from the relevant parties, of course, a sheikh, the judge, the imam, whatever the case may be, uh, and if it's necessary to do so. And those are some of the benefits of this hadith.